Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Technology Learning Collaborative webinar on disability inclusion in digital equity work. My name is Kate Rivera, and I'm a consultant with the Technology Learning Collaborative, or TLC. Uh, and for those of you who may not be familiar with TLC, we are a professional development organization dedicated to digital literacy providers and advocates. Our mission is to drive the digital literacy access and inclusion conversation in Philadelphia by promoting professional collaboration, training and networking among organizations and institutions that have a dedicated interest in moving these areas forward. If you're not already familiar with us, in a few minutes, I'll drop uh, links in the chat for our website and our social media platforms. You can connect with us. Um, and then just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel within a few days after the webinar. So anyone who uh, was unable to attend or wants to re review the recording will be able to do that. And we'll also be emailing the presentation slides uh, to everyone who registered for today's event um, afterwards as well. If you have questions or comments during the presentation, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, and with that, so today we'll be hearing from uh, Diane and Jessica from Networks for Training and Development, and I'm going to turn things over to them. Good afternoon. Um... My name is Diane Kehoe. I work for Networks for Training and Development as their Director of Technology Services. And Jess? Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Stover, also with Networks, and I'm the Director of Training and Consultation. Thanks for having me. So why are we here today? Now, some of this has a little bit of a history, and I'm going to let Diane fill in on that because I was just brought in um, more, more recently. So Diane holds more of the history of how this relationship with you all has blossomed and has been budding over the past few months. And we're just so delighted that you've invited us in to do this session. Um, overall, when we're doing any type of training, whether it is in person, and so today's March 29th, 2022, Hopefully in the future, um, it'll be easier and available to truly meet in person, maybe once we, how we once did. Uh, but in the meantime, a lot of this has shifted to virtual and hybrid platforms. And with that comes the need for access for everyone and making the case for access and accessibility and inclusion and universal design, it's simple. The more people you can get your information to, the more people you reach, the more people that have access to what you do and the good work that you do. And we're here to share points to think about and to make considerations as you're going through and planning your trainings, conducting your trainings, doing the wrap up after your trainings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not gonna be all inclusive because we only have an hour together but it's gonna start the conversation. But I want Diane to give us some of the history and background of how we got to this point today with you all. We received an email from TLC several years back, probably about five, six years. And we started going to the conferences, which were awesome. They still are, your content has been great. And we benefited from them. And But one thing we did encounter is we have colleagues who are maybe blind or deaf or use screen readers or alternative technologies and they were encountering barriers. So we spoke with Kate and said, you know, um, it'd be really great if we could have an opportunity to kind of talk to folks about some of the things you have to consider when you're doing any kind of digital training, whether it be in person or you know virtually, because we know a lot of times you're going out to organizations and helping them create training programs or implementing training programs. And we also virtually, as I said, we, you guys have tons of content. So starting with the why we're here, <clears throat> We gave you a link to Inclusion Hub, hoping you may be familiar with it. 
uh, in our resources, but we want you to consider even when infrastructure and connectivity issues are resolved, that relieves 61 million Americans when at an estimated 1 billion people globally that still face obstacles when it comes to utilizing the web due to digital accessibility chasms. In other words, if we do our best at solving all the infrastructure and access and people have it in their hands, we have these wonderful training programs, but the accessibility issues aren't addressed, the digital divide not only persists, but it can increase for people with disabilities because so many other marginalized groups do get access and people with disabilities, many of whom experience all the same challenges as the folks you're trying to reach, they're farther behind because they still can't access the technology. So again, that question, why are we here? But even larger than that, who benefits from accessibility? Who benefits from access, from universal design, from inclusion right from the start? Well, the answer is, of course, everyone. So to maybe broaden the scope a little further, think about what accessibility pieces you may encounter in your day-to-day -day life. What universal design components do you, just being out in this world, come into contact with, but we're actually designed and put into place for maybe a different grouping of folks. So a fantastic example of this is, I love going to Target, love Target. I go to Target, so when we walk up to Target, what happens? The doors automatically open. When we leave Target, what happens? The doors automatically open. So as I'm leaving Target, with my shopping cart or loaded down with bags because I bought entirely too many things I really did not need, but I couldn't resist myself because Target, those doors open themselves. I do not have to struggle with the bags. I do not have to put things down. So similarly for a mother or father with pushing a stroller and that shopping cart and a couple kids, you know, trailing along or the someone that uses that wheelchair, that is an example of universal design, particularly for people that utilize power chairs and the like so that they can independently access and get into the space. So really you're wanting to welcome people into your space, whether it's a physical space for training or it's a digital space for training and learning and opportunity. Everyone benefits when it's designed from the start for everyone to have equal footing and to be able to come through that door and to sit at your table. I'd love for you to possibly throw in the chat other things you can think of that this was maybe built for someone else, but guess what? I love it. And it makes life so much easier for me. So feel free to throw that in the chat. And there's all sorts of examples when you think about it, even within your own home, light dimmers. That is a piece of accessibility. Today, what you're seeing on the screen, this was designed obviously with inclusion in mind. Uh, Jessica Hall writes in the text, voice to text, text to speech. We use that all the time, don't we? When we are maybe traveling or we're multitasking and we want to send a text, or we want to wake up our phone to, you know, it's going to happen if I do this right now, but I'll say, hey, Siri, call Diane. And Siri, with because I have an iPhone, will call Diane or whatever platform you might use, Alexa or, or what have you. Um, these are all, again, pieces that we every person benefits from and gives everyone equal footing. So thanks for that, Jessica. Yeah, and I know for captions for me, if I'm in a library trying to watch something, yeah. Kate Rivera said closed captioning. If I'm in a noisy environment and I may not be able to hear what's being said on the where I'm at, I can use the captions. Or if I'm somewhere where noise isn't permitted, I can turn my volume off and use the captions. So we can all benefit from accessibility. So we're going to share this and we have the link to this map. This was actually developed by a colleague of ours, a woman who works for the Mayor's Commission on Disabilities. She said, found herself always trying to figure out how many folks with disabilities were in particular communities. 
And so she literally went through all the census information and created this digital resource for folks. And right now she's working on getting this to be accessible, but it's not fully accessible yet. So I am going to give you the heads up about that. But all you do is you click on a tract and it will tell you how many people in that are in that population. How many people have a disability? How many people under the age of five have a disability? And you can keep on using that. And Jess has put the link in the chat to that. And this is a great resource <clears throat> because if you're going to be doing a presentation for a specific group, you can find out, especially with organizations you're working with, how many people are, does that organization potentially work with that they, that have disabilities? So we have some questions to think about. And feel free to put this in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. How many people who receive your digital literacy training have disabilities? I'm gonna actually run through all of these. How many trainers or organization staff experience disability? How many of the TLC membership experience disability? And you may know and you may not know. And there's oftentimes there are what's called, and you probably all may have heard this, hidden disability. Disability that is invisible. A disability that people opt to not disclose. Someone may experience um, sensory difference where sound is too much. And that could be due to a variety of different reasons someone who experiences and is diagnosed with ADHD or autism or a wide spectrum of difference in disability. So some are visible, but often not. Many are invisible. And there are times people choose to not actively disclose that, but still seek to have the accommodations and the access as we all should readily available. So do you have an idea? We don't have hard and fast numbers on this because again, if you go back to that map, you can get um, some rough ideas based on neighborhoods of people who have reported, like Diane shared, people who have reported that's based off of census data who have disclosed disability, who have reported disability. So if you think just from a basis of neighborhood within Philadelphia itself, um, the numbers, well, they're not unexpected to actually see the numbers on paper. There's a particular neighborhood. The neighborhood, I believe, um, had around 3,000 residents. Um, those who um, reported disability, a variety of disability, um, I think the number was a slightly over 800. So if we do the math on that, that's a pretty high percentage of that population. And again, the case for access is you get more people, your information, you can reach more folks when uh, the playing field is leveled for access. And we do that and build it right from the start. One of the reasons we asked about how many of your TLC membership is sometimes what happens with people with disabilities and another colleague of ours experiences this frequently she said if i'm a participant they may be prepared to provide me some kind of accommodation but they never think of me as the trainer having a disability disability can often be considered an us and them thing where we think the people who are receiving our services have the disability and we forget that there are co-workers, colleagues, there are trainers, teachers who also experience disabilities who need accommodation. I'm going to show you a very short video, about five minutes, and we encourage you when you get the PowerPoint, click on this and watch the whole thing because you're going to see the script get flipped on somebody. And in the video, that happens a few times, a few surprises for you. Lift doors open and the man, who's in his 30s, straightens his grey tie and steps out into a sleek reception area. There's a woman sitting at a desk adorned with an expensive floral arrangement and she looks up and smiles. Hi, 
Thomas Howe, I'm here for the interview with Mr. Dexter. Yeah, sure thing. Just take a seat and he'll be out in a minute. Thomas sits on an armchair in the nearby waiting area and glances out the window for a moment before taking a folder from his briefcase. Another young man in a suit is sitting opposite him, toying with an MP3 player. Thomas frowns. Raising his eyebrows, Thomas returns to his folder. He doesn't notice a man with Down syndrome walking towards him. The man, who's wearing a black suit with a colourful striped tie, consults a file and peers at Thomas. Hi, Mr. How is it? Um, yes. Great, I'm James. Please come with me for your interview. 9am? You have the interview at 9am, is it? Um, yes. Great. Come with me for your interview. Thomas glances uncertainly at the meditating man opposite him, then at the receptionist, who's focused on her computer screen. Looking baffled, he tentatively gets up and allows James to show him out of the waiting room, which is overlooking Sydney Harbour and down a corridor lined with offices. Nervous? Ah, uh, it came a scary go for a, a new job. What or coke? Um, water, thanks. Uh, are, are you sure? Water's fine. Uh, coke better. James goes to a refreshments trolley and gets a bottle of water for Thomas and a can of Coke for himself. Thomas eyes his interviewer warily as they both open their drinks. Cheers. Thomas looks uncomfortable as he taps his bottle against James's can. So, you like movies? Uh, yeah. Star Wars. You like Star Wars? Hmm. Harry Potter? Um, not so much, no. What about Voldemort? I love Voldemort. Harry Potter is dead. No, no, no. Silence, stupid girl. Harry Potter is dead. From this day forth, you put your faith in me. I'm just not into it. I've not finished it. Harry Potter is dead. Thomas glances at the door. So the interview's in here? Uh, yes, correct. It's just that it's gone ten past. Great. We'll get straight into it. Isn't someone else going to be joining us? Someone going to be interviewing me? Just me. I noticed you're dressed very conservatively. It's an interview. There's a bit of colour. James indicates his own tie. Thank you. I went through your resume. Yeah, applying for a solicitor role. Yes. Why not senior associate? Sorry? See that painting? Like it? Yep. That's our original Dexter. I have a few of them hanging around the joint. So, you've come from the Mont across the road. They are a great firm. What made you want to change? Thomas, who had been ready to leave, resumes his seat and looks contemplative. James waits with an expectant expression. I didn't think the direction of the company was somewhere I wanted to stay in the long run. More detail. <laughs> I didn't think they did much for the community. They're just a money-making machine. We make a lot of money here too. But your pro bono department has an amazing reputation, particularly with startups. At Le Mans, they rejected a lot of great-looking not-for-profits because they only dealt with more established organisations. I like that answer. You're the first person whose answer I've liked. So. How did the flip the script get flipped for Thomas?
Can you throw that into the chat or open your mic and share it with us? No one? Let me give him some hints, Diane. <laughs> okay. Um, Thomas went into there. And when he found out who was interviewing him, he looked around for confirmation whether that was okay. Do we think of someone with a disability being in the position to interview us? or someone with James's disability being the one to ask us. Alan, Alex shared, he assumed someone else was going to be interviewing him just because the interviewer was someone with a disability. That's right, it's that us them attitude and that, you know, the person cannot be an authority with a disability and we need to challenge that assumption. Now, what else did you notice about that video that you may not see in every video you watch? Or the other is, what did you hear in the video that you might not Definitely. hear in every, so it's, what did you hear that you may not hear in every video that you come into contact? And why is that important? There was I noticed the descriptive audio. Yeah. Which is that way if someone is watching who's maybe visually impaired, then they know what's what's happening on the screen, not they don't just hear the when people are speaking, but they also understand the larger context. Yep. And this was actually something we encountered at one of your conferences as a presenter used video. And the video wasn't captioned, the video wasn't audio described. So we end up doing that for our colleague. Um, so that's the kind of thing you have to think about is, if I were to, now how many of you have seen the new commercial of the Western and the woman interrupts the movie and says, wait a minute, I didn't catch that, I'm hard of hearing. So that's actually coming to forefront. Right, Jessica shares in the chat. What was the title of the video that you shared? Also, the screen is blank now. Yes, because we haven't gone to the next one. So thanks for catching that, Jessica. And that film is from Bus Stop Films and that link will be shared. I believe it's in the PowerPoint, but I'll also try to find the direct link to the full video um, through their website, but you'll also have access to that video um, that Diane will be sharing and how you can get access to that and all the other resources we talked about. Yeah, that, that video is called The Interviewer, and Bus Stop Films is an organization of filmmakers, writers, actors, whatever in the film industry, but it's an inclusive film industry with actors, writers, you know, directors, whatever, who have disabilities. And they create cutting edge video about today's current events issues that we're all facing. They're an awesome resource. But this was the interviewer and the link for the today's media that's in the PowerPoint will show you the whole film. And I encourage you to do that. So there was audio description and there was captioning. Just think about it. Just try watching your next film with your eyes closed. Or the next TV show you watch with your eyes closed and don't open them now and try and figure out what's really going on. And then you'll understand how audio description and captioning are both so very important. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we already touched on some of this, but just to kind of continue that, you know, is disability always visible? No, 
we, we, we have covered that. Do people always disclose that they may have disability or experience disability and why or why not? So what are some of the reasons that maybe you yourself if you have a disability that you have or have not disclosed, or maybe there's friends or coworkers or others that you know that may or have or have not disclosed that they do experience disability and some of the reasons that they've given. Um, so I can share to get started. One of our coworkers, um, generally she will disclose, uh, particularly if she's attending training, that she will disclose. So. Um, you know, the organization that's hosting or the trainer will be aware of what accommodation she needs so that she can get all of the information that everyone else will already have access to. There's times, however, where she's chosen to not disclose in other situations because um, of the stigma she experiences of when she says, hey, I have a disability. Um, you know, she shared and others that I've known and, you know, Diane has known others that oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes it seems, seems of what happens as soon as someone says, hey, I have this disability, what it turns into is we feel sad for that person. Oh, that must be so difficult. Oh, how terrible for you that, that it's, it's this curse or this burden to bear. And most people say it's, it's part of who I am. So there, there's other reasons too why people don't disclose. Some people do disclose in this day and age, do not disclose for fear of discrimination of if they disclose they have the disability, say when applying on for a job, that they will not get hired. That is clearly illegal. That cannot be done, but it still does happen in the United States and around the world. What are some other reasons that people may choose to not disclose they have a disability? And you can just continue to think on that, or if it comes to you later, something you want to share, please feel free to put it into the chat. Um, I want to go over just a few other pieces we did already talk about a little bit. Do accommodations only benefit the audience targeted? And you know, we said no. The answer is no. Some other examples of that universal design, that access, the accommodation, the accessibility pieces that you'll experience: captioning, transcript, audio description, curb cuts. Curb cuts are a great example in your day-to-day -day life, just being out in the world. The other is, um, and more and more kind of those home gadgets are being made so that they're easy for everyone to use. If you're familiar with the OXO good grips, like spatulas or things, and I apologize, Alexa just turned on for some reason. Um, those are designed for people to be able to use them readily. They're designed with larger grips. They're designed with high contrasting colors to be able to see the handles and what you're supposed to be, you know, the proper end of the spatula to be utilizing. Alex, um, shared, the Alex yes. shared, Jess. I think this is related to what you said already, but a reason someone might not disclose is not to face others treating them differently, judgment, mm -hmm. pity, awkwardness afterwards. You're right there. And what we've done is in the media, we're going to provide two links. Actually, we already did provide them on that today's media link. There are two podcasts and it's an interview with someone with a disability talking about what is proper disability etiquette. Of course, there might be some awkwardness, especially if you're not used to interacting with someone with a disability. You know, well, what do I say? What do I, you know, where do I look? Uh, how do I approach them? And it's like, these are honest questions some people may have. And this person shares, this is what common disability etiquette should be. So when you're interacting with participants or coworkers or colleagues who have a disability, you may have a little bit of more comfort in doing so. The person also shares in the interview about disclosure from two perspectives from this is why I may or may not disclose, but then if you have a disability, these are the things you may wanna think about before disclosing. So both of those resources will be available. Some considerations for accessibility. And the way I like to talk to people about this is we have the five categories here, the physical space, 
the sensory space, as Jess was telling you, you know, um, cognitive, uh, what does a cognitive limitation present when you are in a digital space or in a training environment? Self-care and mental health. Uh, people forget that there are also mental health accommodations that need to be thought about for training. Um, and also the digital, uh, someone's access to digital, which many of you address, the infrastructure, all of that. But the way I ask people is when you're training, ask yourself these things, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's virtual, how are people seeing your presentation and materials? And seeing is in those air quotes because it may not be the traditional way. How are people hearing your presentation materials? How are people taking part in my activities? Have you even seen, you know, well, we said about the commercial, but those questions for me help me flag a potential barrier. I remember planning a, a training and no one said they needed accommodations and I had planned a physical activity and in someone walked in a wheelchair, using a wheelchair and someone else in the group uh, was blind. And I was like, okay, I need to change up here because I need an activity that these two people can actively participate in too, or I need to adjust my activity. And I was able to do it fairly quickly because I had, that's one thing that we had always kind of do here as we think of alternatives. But I, one thing you may not realize is in the chat, if someone is blind, you need to help them out by regularly letting them know what's in the chat. Because what I was sharing with Kate beforehand is, think of listening to two people talk at once. If someone is blind, the way they access media is through a screen reader. Now they're in a training and they're supposed to listen to the trainer, but they're also supposed to listen to their screen reader reading what's on the screen or in the chat. And it gets very hard to try and listen to two people talk at one time. So that's a way to think about that. And so sharing the slides ahead of time with someone may help. <clears throat> Any suggestions on how best to encourage people to share? Um, Jess is going to cover that, but there are things you can do to make sure people know, I care about the fact that you may need an accommodation, and I'm prepared to make that happen with no judgment. And the way you present your marketing and other materials is going to help you with that. Uh, and as I said, we will take be discussing that over the next few slides. Jess? So when you're building and creating a session, again, I'm gonna be covering um, when we are in a physical space doing face-to-face -face training. Diane will then be talking about how to build from start to finish and the considerations for virtual and or hybrid. So for face-to-face, -face, a lot of this, I'm gonna say this and you're gonna be like, well, yes, of course. But a lot of it's good reminders or maybe there's some pieces that you hadn't considered. But right from the start, when you're actually building the session after say the contents have been developed, you're ready to get people to register to come to your session. You need to look at how are people able to register? Is the registration interface that you're using, such as say Eventbrite or any other uh, platform of that nature, is it accessible? Is that portal able to be utilized for people? So a great example, so within, um, I'm gonna talk about Eventbrite specifically, one of the pieces we had to adjust right away, there's a timer when someone says, yes, I wanna attend and they click, yes, I want to attend. And then they start filling in their information it timed out after five minutes. And I got several calls from different people saying, it's not giving me enough time to put in all my information before you know, it, it like kicks me back out and I have to start over because of a variety of different reasons. So as to make it more accessible, we extended that time to a 20 minute time period where it held that registration open while they were taking the time they needed 
to complete and to fill out that form. So that's just one tiny, tiny example, but very important for people to be able to even get in the door, quote unquote, to get to your session. Obviously for physical space, you wanna be taking into consideration the access of the space. Are there stairs? Are there ramps? Are there elevators? The doorways, are they wide enough? What is the layout of the facility like that you're gonna be utilizing? Is it close to um, public transportation? How easy is it to get from point A to point B um, if someone would be using a bus or the subway, um, things of that nature? Are there sidewalks out front that someone can safely get from, say the bus stop or the subway to the front door of that facility? Are there curb cuts? All of these physical things you really need to be taking into account when you're even at the start of picking a venue. Um, oftentimes it's not an issue, but there have been moments we've encountered where we've had to turn away from um, a physical location because, so a good example is they um, said they were ADA accessible. So one of the things we always have is we have one of our coworkers go and do an on-site visit. Uh, his name is Andrew, he utilizes a power chair, um, talented beyond belief in all forms of technology and marketing and things of that nature. He's a fantastic guy, but the other component, he does on-site visits to ensure that when they say, yes, this space is accessible, he can actually get in and out the door. He can get into the restroom. So there was a space that said, yes, we are ADA compliant, we are accessible. He was not able to get into the bathrooms. The doorway to get into the bathroom was wide enough. He could not get into any of the stalls. So they were not ADA compliant. You can't, you can't kind of be accessible. You can't kind of, it's, it's black and white. Either your, your space is accessible or it's not. Either your session is accessible or it's not. Try hard, try and make a really good effort, but particularly for physical spaces, if it's not accessible, it's not accessible. Particularly so really bathrooms with this, um, what sometimes happens is, Someone can get their chair in a bathroom, but in such a way that the door cannot close or there's no room for an aide to be there with them. So mm -hmm. now they have lost the dignity of privacy. So that area would not be accessible and would not be considered by us. Absolutely, absolutely. What is the layout of the space like? So the room you're gonna be using, how close it is to, is it to the restrooms or other facilities? How easy is it to navigate? to get from the front desk to where the room is. Are things clearly marked? Um, if you wanna get really nuanced and specific, uh, if you wanna look at, and you're gonna need someone to check this for you, but oftentimes you'll see there will be say room numbers and under there you'll see, or you'll be able to feel the braille. And we were at a conference out of state and one of our coworkers was with us attending as well. Uh, she is blind, utilizes Braille. And we said, oh, this is great. Look, this is, everything is marked for you. This is fantastic. And it was not labeled correctly. She was looking for her room, which I, I wanna say it was like 608 was, was, was the hotel room she was staying in. And so she checked it and it said like dog or something. It didn't even have, it didn't even say a number. It was like this random string of words and letters that had zero meaning in relation to this is room 608. So that was brought to the attention of the hotel. Right? Um, but, you know, again, are things clearly marked? And if it's not, how can you assist that space to be clearly marked? Can you bring in your own signage? Can you make sure that from point A to point B, it's a seamless process, or are you gonna be going through a literal maze? Um, we've experienced that as well. We had a conference, we had everything planned out. And then I think this was many years ago, they moved rooms on us at the very last minute due to a scheduling conflict. And attendees were having to go up two or three flights of stairs, walking down long hallways, literally having to go outside to a different space. Um, it was inconvenient to say the least, but even more inconvenient for those who utilized a walker or a wheelchair or who had visual impairments. It was not conducive to learning in that day. Um, the other within the space within the room itself or even overall, you wanna be looking at the lighting. 
um, natural lighting is the optimal. You want natural lighting as much as possible. However, that's not always feasible. So of course, sometimes we are having to deal with fluorescent lighting. Fluorescent lighting can be very difficult. Um, next time you're in a room with fluorescent lighting, see if you can hear the humming that's being emitted from that light. You're gonna hear it more, particularly if that fluorescent bulb is just about to go and it's kind of on its last leg, you're gonna hear that humming. You might even hear it clicking. And that humming for someone who is very sensitive to sound, that's gonna be all they're going to be hearing. Um, the lighting, it can be very harsh. So if you can adjust the lighting, be sure to be mindful of that. You also wanna be looking at um, scent. Is the space scent free? Are, are you um, being mindful not to, you know, if you're at the registration table, if you are the presenter or you're assisting um, for the coordination of that day, um, are you being mindful of the cologne and perfumes that you're wearing? Uh, maybe essential oils and aromatherapy you may have on yourself or in the room. Um, cleaning products that may be very overwhelming within the space. Some things we can control, some things we can't, but we wanna do our darndest to try to at least be very mindful and control as much as we can. I already covered sound, but you can also have ambient sound. Um, you definitely do not wanna be holding a training where that room is butted right up against the kitchen. What are you gonna hear throughout the entire training, particularly if it's close to lunchtime or they're getting um, your lunch ready or you're getting, uh, ready for the break. You're going to hear the banging and clanging of pots and pans because they're back there going on with their day doing their job. It comes through those walls and sometimes it can be severe. It could be very significant. Um, clearly Diane's going to cover this more in depth, but thinking about the media that you're providing, the captioning, the transcripts, audio description in videos. One thing that we have, um, and this is also going to be provided, um, as far as like a how-to checklist, we provide step-by-step -step instruction for presenters that we bring in as far as when they are developing their handout materials, the content that they're presenting, particularly with PowerPoints. You want to, in presentations, if you use another platform or format, you want to think about the seven by seven rule, seven lines, seven words per line. You can exceed that slightly, but not a lot. That's a good rule of thumb. If you do you know, eight lines, nine lines, okay, not the end of the world, not optimal, but it works. And you'll see in here, you know, I think we do have eight lines in total. Um, sometimes it is unavoidable. You do not want to be seeing materials that have 20 and 30 lines. For the text size, you want to be keeping your text size to at least 20. I personally try to go 24. Um, keep your uh, serif font to a minimum. You'll see we do use that here, but it is only a splash here and there. The overall font is a sans serif, again, for readability, for someone that can quickly engage with that material. Serifed fonts can be very, very hard to read. There's, there's soft skills you want to be taking into account as well, like the soft pieces. So when you're having, particularly if it's a long day event, and if, again, if you have things to chime in, please feel free to put it in the chat, interrupt me, raise your hand, open your mic. Um, you wanna be, if you're able to provide either space for people to take a break, a space for them to get away, relax, or be offering break times and even state at the beginning of the session, do what you need to do to make yourself comfortable and to be able to stay present with me, with us during this time together. And that goes for you all. Even in this day and age of virtual, you know, sessions, people will turn off their mics, turn off their cameras, go grab a drink of water, go stretch, do what you need to do to stay comfortable. We don't want to have with any training, any exclusion or segregation. And we bring up this point. Um, there was an instance, very well-meaning staff at the venue setting up for us, um, getting ready for the day. They created um, a table that was specifically for people that use wheelchairs. I would like to ask you all, why was this problematic? Feel free to put it in the chat. They created a table exclusively for those who utilize wheelchairs. Why do you think that was problematic? It singles people out who use wheelchairs from Alex, correct? Correct. All means all. 
there, um, it created a separate space, a separate area where people stand out. Nathan said it excludes those folks. Absolutely. They're still, but the argument was made, but they're still in the same room with you all. Yes, but they have to sit at a special separate table. Kate says it also takes choice away from them of where they want to sit. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. These are all perfect, absolute fine points that you make and you're all spot on, which warms the cockles of my heart. You get it. That's awesome. That's awesome. A big thing when you're doing training, whether it's a, you know, a one hour in person training or a three day event extravaganza symposium, have at least one person as your point person for oversight for the event, for all the behind the scenes, obviously, for making sure the gears are turning correctly, that everything is happening as it's supposed to, so that this person can be connecting one with the participants. Um, they can be engaging and guiding the staff so to avoid that separate table that in their minds was well-meaning, but then also providing them with why it doesn't work and here's a better way for full inclusion. The other piece is to be thinking about um, when you are having someone register for your session, whether it is face-to-face -face or in person, but right from the start with that registration, you wanna be asking the question, do you have any accommodation needs? People may indicate yes, Someone may not say. So for those times when they do indicate, you wanna be asking, um, do you need alternative formats? Do you need digital formats? Do you need interpreters? Do you need sign language interpreters? Do you need materials in advance? Do you need a note taker in some instances, a guide for the physical space? Um, there's the conference that um, I attend um, and it is in a massive, massive, massive conference space. And to walk from one end to the other, I'm not joking, takes about 15 minutes. And that's at a good clip, like really kind of, you know, moving quick. Um, and there's a lot of side halls and rooms. And one of the things they provide in those instances, because the space is so massive, um, they provide a guide to, you know, help them along to get from point A to point B, should they wish. Um, making accommodations for service animals. The space, um, do they have a space available outdoors that is a relief area for um, your various service animals that the person uh, may have with them? From dogs to, we've seen service cats, we've seen service peacocks, <laughs> we've seen emotional, maybe not the service peacocks, but I have seen service emotional support peacocks. I have experienced them. They're lovely creatures. Uh, but, um, not, not making light of that, but these are all things to really consider. And if you can't quite get there, try your darndest to get there. In the instance where someone arrives where they clearly are in need of an accommodation, but did not indicate it. So for large print um, or even brailled materials, if you would have hard copy, always have one or two available. Even if no one indicates you have them on hand. Um, it's very inexpensive to do just have them available. That way when someone says, oh, hey, I'm sorry, um, I really need this. You can have it available. If it should happen where they indicate and maybe we fall short, be sincere and apologize. I am so sorry, what can I do to make this right? Let's think this through together. What suggestions can you give me to be sure that we get this right in the future? Own it. Um, you know, at networks, you know, we're in, we've, we've been doing this work for 30 years now. And Diane will tell you, any of us will, and, and networks will tell you, we're not perfect. We don't get it right all the time. We miss the boat, um, but we own it and we learn from it. And when we do stumble, we share it with others so that um, you know, others can learn from it too. So when that time does happen, you know, have honest conversations with the person that is in need or, you know, the interpreter wasn't there on time or their interpreter that, you know, say it was a sign language interpreter, they didn't hit the mark and they weren't doing their job well, work with them to make it right. You know, support them and really listen to people. I could go on and on, we could go on and on, but I wanna move along because I'm seeing the clock. I'm gonna turn it back over to Diane, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Well, for virtual as well, we need the registration portal. And I remember when we were shopping for registration software here at Networks, we found the ideal software. It did everything we wanted post, pre, during an event. It had 
It was a great portal for speakers to upload handouts. It was wonderful. The only problem is it was not accessible. And we reached out to them and the executive director of the organization actually met with us and we shared just how much we did love the product. But we said, you know what? If you ever get your product accessible, give us a ring because we'll sign up right away. You know, and he said, he said, thank you. He said, it's not something we even considered and we should have. You know, so now they're working on it. They're not there yet because they have a lot of gears. They've got a shift and a lot of programming that has to happen. But at least we've shared with them and we've made them aware. And it was not in a way to be vindictive or to put anyone down. It was in a way of, you know, we really love your product and we'd love to be able to use it, but we can't. Yeah. Um, what platform are you using that is accessible? Um, and I have experienced this not with disability, but I literally was doing a meeting with an organization and their meeting platform only allowed you to use Chrome or Edge. And I kind of scratched my head because all I could think of is how many browsers, how many people got excluded from that training simply because they didn't have those browsers. You know, um, the media, again, captions, audio transcription, transcripts for podcasts and more. Um, sometimes when you're doing media, even photos, it's really hard to find diverse, diverse media. Try and look for media that is diverse, though. Um, and that's something that we're always looking for. Um, what activities are you doing and think, can all participants engage with your activities? In our trainer's boot camp, we use two things. We use a video clip uh, talking about the world's worst trainer. Uh, and then we also use a origami activity. And I'm thinking, okay, I knew someone blind was going to be attending the training. And all I could think of is how does someone who is blind do origami and this video is 90% visual humor. So I literally downloaded it, captioned it, and audio described it myself. But then, you know, I used it because I knew this person would benefit. And I checked in with the person afterwards, and they said, oh, I knew exactly what was going on. You got it. You know, so the video was able to be used. Also, I found out that there is origami for the blind. And I downloaded the instructions and gave it to them and they were able to do the activity. So it doesn't always mean you can't do an activity, you just might have to work a little harder at it. But think of your activities, how can everybody engage? All right, your chat I also already talked about um, that you need to make sure that you're stating what's in the chat. Um, this is a, when your presenters are presenting, make sure they describe what's going on on their slides. Document sharing, we all use it. Oh, I'll put it up on Google Drive for you. I'll put it up on Dropbox for you. You have to make sure whatever document sharing medium you're using, is it going to be accessible? Can you provide documents in advance so folks can follow along? If you can't provide an accessible Maybe you don't have an accessible format. I know for some people, Google Drive is great. For others, it can present a challenge. But think of an equitable alternative. And an equitable alternative is to email those things separately to someone uh, so that they can use them. But always think about, is what I'm using going to be usable? This is also important when it comes to, there are so many creative online activities now. People are always telling us as a training organization, oh, did you see this cool tool? Did you see that cool tool? The one, um, is it uh, Kumo Space is a new one out. Uh, and we went in there to Kumo Space to look at it. And we basically looked and said, well, we would have to assign a guide to anyone who had a visual disability once they got into Kumo space, because that would be the only way they could get from point A to point B. And we would have to make sure, so it wasn't like we threw Kumo space out of consideration, but automatically when we were in there, our staff started 
slinging ideas about, well, we'd have to do this and we'd have to do that. And they were coming up with the ideas. Um, one of our coworkers said, you know, this access accessibility stuff is important, but now it's invading my personal life here. She was on a meeting with some friends and they were playing a digital game. And she said, sure enough, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, how could I use this game with someone who was blind? How could I use this game with someone who was deaf? How could I? she goes, I'm not even trying to think that way, but that's the way I'm thinking. And I'm, you know, for better or worse, that's what happens when you think about accessibility. It just becomes part of the natural flow of things that you're thinking that way. Again, the presentation rule seven by seven, seven words per line, we encourage that. Not only because nobody wants to read a 20 line PowerPoint slide, but because white space is very important for folks who may have a cognitive disability or have difficulty focusing, the white space helps them follow along. So it's important not to take away that white space. We have some resources for you. Um, the one is Inclusion Hub. It provides awesome recommendations and it literally breaks it down by disability for visual disability, hearing, cognitive, mental health, all the accommodations you should think about when you're working with someone who may have those limitations. The Cornell uh, planning and accessible events. Now the Cornell University website created this for their staff. And I love it because the one statement within their website says to their instructors, if you're, if someone asks you for an accommodation and it's such an accommodation that you're considering telling them you can't do it, stop. Ask the accessibility team and we'll let you know. In other words, the last thing you want to do is say, no, I can't. Let's try and figure it out. Accommodation resources. Otter AI is a great transcription tool. It can provide captioning in live Zoom. Although we got to tell you it's in a separate browser window, so it can be a little unwieldy for some folks to manage. Uh, the same thing happens with the um, tool Kahoot, although they've made some changes recently that I think have addressed it that you don't need a separate browser window. Uh, Rev captioning is an awesome service. And what Rev does is it provides the captioning, it provides the transcripts, it can convert your transcript or your captions into another language for you um, and more. Okay, And what's nice is the captions show up in the Zoom window. Kate is using Zoom's built-in live captioning and transcription, which is great. Um, there are also third-party captioning services. The only problem with them, I don't know how they work in other formats, but in Zoom, we were noticing up to a 15 second lag and it became really difficult for someone to follow. I don't know if you use audiobooks in creating your training materials. Now, an audiobook takes that book and it presents it in an audio format for someone who has a print disability. Um, if you're creating audiobooks or if you're creating booklets or books, sometimes it's important to think about creating an audio version of that book. If you do, it also needs to be in a DAISY format, not just an audiobook format. DAISY format is a format that not only provides the words, but it provides some sensory feedback as well, so that someone with a print disability can really carry on. And surprisingly, Daisy is not an expensive, we had like a 25 page book that we created here at Networks, and it cost us $65 to get it converted to Daisy format which is really not a lot of money to make it accessible for folks. So we, you know, Rev can be a little pricey, letting you know that up front. Um, Otter is $20 a host a month. Rev Zoom captioning is $20 a month per host. But the captioning afterwards, if you need to get materials captioned or a video captioned, it's like $1.25 a minute. It's really not bad. Disability characteristics map, there's the link for that. 
we encourage you to use that. There's a company called Numa Solutions. It's run by a man who has a visual disability and he offers accessibility information and solutions for people with print disabilities. Um, an organization, it's a little pricey still, but organizations can embed his tool scribe onto their websites so that when people come onto their website, they can convert any documents they download, but someone with a disability can purchase that solution for themselves. Again, bus stop films, the inclusive films, awesome films. So we encourage you to look there. And then I have a link there also for today's media. We want to stop and answer any questions you may have. And as we said, this is just an overview. So any questions that you have that you want to ask Jess and I. Understand, you need to drop off. Cool. Thank you, Karen. Well, thank you so much, Diane and, and Jess for sharing all of those great resources, as well as um, the perspective that you brought to this webinar. Uh, I found it really useful. I, I think folks, other folks here did as well. Um, so I do also want to thank everyone who tuned in for today's webinar. Um, also want to give thanks to Comcast. They are a sponsor of TLC's monthly webinar series. Um, I did put a link in the chat for a feedback form. If folks can just take a minute to fill that out for us, that gives us information about how we're doing with our monthly webinars, what topics we could cover in the future, uh, any needs you may have. Um, I looks like a few thank yous in the chat. Uh, I don't think there are any any further questions. Any any closing words, uh, Diane and Jess? Thank you for having us. It's been exciting. We love to share with you. We love to learn from you. And we have learned a lot from you guys, just so you know. Uh, you have an expertise that we don't always have about how to tackle the infrastructure and all that other stuff. But you know, well, thank you for letting us share what we know. I'll just say really quick, if, if you take anything else away from today, or if, if you watch this again down the road or someone else is watching it a few months from now, um, you just have to try. You might not get it right, but letting the status quo maintain um, is not the way to, to, to move forward. You have to at least try, make an effort, and you're gonna, you're gonna come out ahead every time and you're gonna be benefiting those to create greater access to the information. And okay. trying is the best way to let someone know with a disability that you care of their, about their access. And since you care about their access, it's safe for them to disclose to you what they need. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day.